Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. And yes, I do still have a cold, so you'll have to forgive my voice for sounding a little bit strange. Now I did recently make a silk blouse here on the channel with giant sleeves, modifying my usual shirt pattern to get this new epic silk worthy version. But I wanted to go ahead and combine some ideas from that shirt style with my peasant blouse, my rectangular peasant blouse base that I made a couple of years ago. I can put a card up to this video as well, showing how I make these vaguely historic inspired, history bounding shirts that work for several eras, depending on how you style them. And that pattern I made with just rectangles, just taking my measurements and adding ease to that and coming up with these rectangles using that method. And then today I wanna to go ahead and actually use my block pattern as a starting point and then get to a similar design starting with the block pattern as a base. And again, the style I'm making today will be similar in that it's inspired by historic menswear shirts, anything from the 19th, 18th, 17th century, vaguely pirate, vaguely swashbuckling, you know, cavalier-ish, romantic, you know, all the way back to medieval, random large men's shirts. Only of course, instead of a like white linen today, I'm going to be using a red and black silk tupioni. But let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started on this darkly romantic blouse. So yes, that's right. I'll be starting with my basic bodice block to make this today. Rather an oversized and geometric shirt pattern in the end, and also quite genderless, I would say. I usually make quite high femme things here, um, but this actually I do think would work for any and all genders of human. So I've drawn in my darts, and now I'm going to first extend my shoulder line outwards, because I'm going to be creating a yoke that is so long that it drops off my sleeve. So I'm extending that an additional four inches out from my normal shoulder tip, and then I'm coming two inches down from the neckline and squaring this off to be my front yoke here. And so I will label it as such. Now here, I'm going to be ignoring my waist dart and moving my side dart into gathers here at my yoke. I'm gonna put those about, I don't know, three inches apart here. I'll show you what that looks like. And then I'll be keeping this waist dart right where it is, but I just won't be sewing it in. So it'll be oversized again, as opposed to fitting closely to the body. But I'll start cutting this out by cutting off the yoke here. So let me go ahead and do that. My center fronts of both this piece and the rest of the front of the shirt will be cut on the fold eventually. But I have my center front marked there. I'm going to cut in to the apex from my side dart here and then up to where I want to put that fullness, up into the yoke basically. And I will close that side dart and layer that shut. This original side seam won't matter in a minute. You'll see what I mean. Cut this along the center front. Won't need that for now, like so. Now I'm going to add some extra paper to the length of this so I can make this long enough to tuck in to whatever I'm wearing. Um, you don't have to tuck things in, but I always tuck things in at the waist. Again, no one is surprised there. So I'm gonna add some length to be able to do that. I think I add on about seven inches down from the original waist of this. Of course, this original pattern has seam allowance. So it's about a half inch longer than my waist would be normally already. And then I'm just gonna add seven inches to that. Then I'm gonna come out two inches from my original side seam at the underarm, like so like so. Oh, two and a half, sorry. Correction, two and a half. You can do as much as, or as little ease as you want, honestly. Um, the more, the looser it's going to fit, obviously. I'm going to tape on some more paper up here as well. I do need to add seam allowance eventually, but really we're going to square this off or rectangle it off. So this up here, I'm going to straighten off from the center front, measure my distance from where I came out from the side seam and make that equal down here. You can make this wider if you want to, if you have a larger hip measurement, perhaps. Um, this should be good enough to encompass my hip, no problem here, or my high hip at least. This is all going to get gathered down, this like middle section is going to get gathered down to fit into my yoke, because of course this is now much wider than my yoke. But that's how I arrived at this rectangle shape. I added two and a half inches at the underarm at the side seam, squared off everything from that, and then made this seven inches longer as well. So you can see my original pattern is floating in here. I'm telling you the numbers of this, but it doesn't really matter. Whatever your numbers end up to be, that is good. So here's my front. This is going to get cut on the fold, like so. Why does it say O-I-V? On fold. <laughs> Tape down my floops here. And then you can see this uh, yoke and this bot main body of the shirt are now different widths. So of course the main body of the shirt will be gathered down into the yoke. And because these two pieces you know, have this style line here along the yoke. I need to add seam allowance, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, it probably would have been fine lengthwise, but I would have lost an inch of length if I didn't add seam allowance here, of course. So making sure to do that. And now I have my front arranged. And I'm just gonna do like two sections of gathering, one on either the left and the right here um, of this to uh, arrange that gathering next to the yoke. I'm going to 
layer these two pieces up where they will be shut and come down 10 inches. That's where my sleeve will connect. Um, just something to know for later. And I'll tape these pieces back together, again, layering my seam line, layering the seam allowance closed, so I can trace a facing to the front of this. You can make your little neckline slit or opening as long as you want. I'm going to make mine a little rectangle kind of slit today that comes down, I don't remember, maybe like mm, 10 or 11 inches from the front here. I eyeballed it, as you can see, I did not measure it, but my facings are always at least two and a half inches wide, so you can see that's what I'm doing here for this facing, which again will be cut on the fold as well. And I'll show you how I do this slit later. Um, so you'll see exactly how I'm going to use this facing to my advantage. I do not need a back facing for this because there will be a stand collar on this blouse and that will encase the raw edge of the back of the neck of this. So I'm just doing a front facing on this and it will be connected at the shoulders and I don't have a back facing for this one. I'm actually gonna make this slit about apex level. So if you can see my original apex in there, that's about where my slit will end but you can decide how small or large, as long as your neckline is big enough that you can fit it over your head, of course, which is the most important thing. Set that front stuff aside so I can start working on the back. So I'm gonna trace my back here. Once again, this back normally has a dart. We're gonna go ahead and just ignore that entirely for this. And this is gonna be, if anything, a little bit more geometric than the front. Um, but again, I'm gonna add that same extra length on here. So seven inches down from the waist. And once again, I'm going to extend my shoulder line and make a nice long yoke here. I'm gonna make this yoke a little bit deeper. So I think I come down five and a half inches. It says six here, but I come up half an inch, see? Five and a half inches for my yoke. This is kind of a deep back yoke on this, just to kind of control the amount of fullness I'll be putting into the back of this. But this is my back yoke cut on the fold. Once again, I squared off four inches from my shoulder line and just kind of squared everything off. I marked my 10 inches down for my sleeve before I started cutting this part. And then I'm gonna add two inches at the center back here of gathering. I'm gonna have that gather, uh, gathering on the back, down the center between where my darts used to be. And you can see I'm coming out that two and a half inches from my side seam arm side again, like so. And then I will square off this piece so that we can start getting, again, just rectangles, but based on the block pattern as a way of starting. This is about 15 inches wide from my back here. But I was noticing that because the length of my back bodice and front bodice is not actually equal uh, because my body is an organic shape and not something that's perfect. Um, I do need to just make sure I'm walking the side seam of this with the front and the back to make sure I have made the back long enough, which I haven't. So I'm just going to add this extra bit of length on because it needed to be longer than this. Like so. And this again will be cut on the fold. So it's 15 inches wide right now, but in the end it will be 30 minus an inch for seam allowance. So you know what I mean. Cut out my yoke as well. And then once again, I'm gonna add seam allowance to the yoke and the shirt since everything is designed to line up as such. And we can always have fun adding seam allowance at a thousand times speed here, which is much faster than I can do in reality. This will gather down again to fit back into our yoke. No problem there. But again, we've started with our block pattern and ended up with rectangles that are just my body plus plenty of ease, honestly. Once again, I just want to line this up with the front to make sure I have uh, the 10 inches mark for where my sleeve will be the same on either piece. Should be 10 inches down. I know. Shocking. But that's where my sleeve will go. And I'll show you my sleeve pattern in just a moment because that one I will distract from scratch because it is just a giant rectangle. So I have my sleeve pattern here. This is based off of that 10 inches down. So I started with a center line, did the 10 inches out on either side for the front and back. And then I added four inches to either side of that for extra gathering and ease so I can make a very giant sleeve. And then the length of this is actually the same as my sleeve pattern minus one inch, basically. So I think in the end, it's like 21 and three fourths or something. I don't know. My sleeve is about 22 to 23 inches long normally. So. This is just a little bit shorter because the yoke and the top of the shirt hangs off my shoulder. My sleeve can be shorter and yet we will still have a very, a longer sleeve than normal because of that dropped shoulder. And then for my cuff, I just have a rectangle that's three inches wide for a finished cuff width of one inch and nine inches long to go around my wrist. Um, you can play around with this. I do suggest making a mock-up if you're going to change anything this dramatically because you don't know how much ease you're going to want in your cuff, but also just in the shirt itself. This is one where I do recommend making a mock-up. And then the last thing I have to do is draft my stand collar. So I'm going to measure the back neck of my pattern, which is three and seven eighths. I'll mark that on this little crossed point here. So I'm measuring the back of the neck of my shirt, three and seven eighths, like so, mark that. And then the front is four. I measured the front of my neckline as well. 
Then at the end here, I'm going to come up a half inch and then uh, tip up the end of it with my French curve here, like so. And then I will measure an inch and a quarter up. This is how high I made this collar. You can make it taller if you want. You can make it shorter if you want. The shorter you make it, the more annoying it's going to be, though. So I would, wouldn't go under an inch. Just square that off, and then everything is just going to need seam allowance. So I'll go ahead and add half inch seam allowance on all of this as well. And that's just my quick and, you know, easy stand collar plan here. I'm going to have this be a pointed collar today instead of rounding off the tip of that. I'll go ahead and cut that out like so, and I will again cut this on the fold. So I'll just mark that for myself, collar. And this is how my pattern pieces are going to fit onto my uh, like 52, 54 inch wide Dupioni. My sleeve is actually a tiny bit too wide. So I lost about an inch of width from my pattern in cutting this out. So I can cut it out on the cross weave like that just to try and maximize the amount of fabric I had left over, I guess, because the scraps like this, I can, especially in this color, I can stiffen and make silk flowers out of sometimes. So I definitely save scraps of silk like this, try and save as much silk as possible. And I did cut out two of my collar. Um, so I have one to face itself with as well. Cut out my cuffs, set those over by the ironing board. And then I can get started on the other pieces of this. You do want to kind of mark these things with like disappearing ink or pins or some way to tell yourself which piece you're working on because when everything is just a rectangle, it's easy to get turned around. I'm going to mark with pins where I need my gathering threads to go. Um, I just kind of determined how much gathering I want on the front here. Again, this is kind of something that I know from experience. You can have a smaller section of gathering if you want. Um, again, perhaps best to make a mock-up for this one. Use some spare fabric. Even a muslin, one of these, in like plain cotton muslin, would be very wearable if it came out the way you like. Um, but adjusting the widths and the gathering for something like this is something you kind of want to do based on personal taste and by how weighty your fabric is going to be. Um, this fabric, I don't think, could take any more gathering than I put in here because this is quite a uh, crisp fabric. It's full of a lot of body, this Silk Dupioni from Silk Baron. I will link this fabric below. Um, so if I put any more gathering than this in here, I think it would just be too poofy, actually. But something like a much drapier cotton shirting or um, a different kind of silk, like a drapier, flowier silk, I could do a lot more gathering, get away with a lot more gathering if I made this out of like silk chiffon, for example. Although that would also be a nightmare. So I'll stick with the crispy do peony, please. I'm just kind of marking on my front where I want that gathering to end up again on the yoke as well. This I don't have to put gathering threads in, it's just where I'm going to line up my gathering from the rest of the bodice to, or shirt, I suppose. I'm so used to saying bodice. I have my giant sleeve here that it's still, I cut on the fold, so I need to cut the fold part here because I need two sleeves, not one absolutely gigantic sleeve, like so. And I'll mark the center of these, and then again, where I want to gather for this. I know I need uh, 20 inches total, so I'm just going to gather this down in the center, um, about, I don't know, six inches out either side, and then gather it down to 20 inches so that it will fit onto the rectangle of my uh, shirt. You'll see how I add the sleeves later while the shirt is still kind of flat, but we'll get to that. And then I do have some leftover strips here that are two inches wide that I will use for some ties at the wrist and then some placket work at the shirt front. So you'll see that later on. All right, so over here on the ironing board, I will go ahead and do some very lightweight interfacing, fusible interfacing for my cuffs and on my collar as well. So just go ahead and glue those buddies down, press them with my iron. Luckily, this Dupioni does, uh, responds quite well to being pressed, so no problem there. I do have a blue light on our red Dupioni today. This is a black and red uh, iridescent or shot silk here. So we have another two-tone iridescent moment, this time just with black. I use a lot of iridescent fabrics that are a color one way and black the other. I believe the cross weave of this is the red and then the, the warp threads are black. Do I have that right? Oh. A textiles class was a while ago, okay guys? I'm sorry. But again, I will just interface this collar piece, just the one side. This fabric is quite crispy. So again, I really only need to interface the one side of this collar to make it stand a little bit higher. And I will go ahead and just pin this so I can sew my collars together here, like two bits of collar. Again, I'm just gonna sew around the top of this, not sewing the last half inch. So the last half inch next to the neckline at the bottom, I'm going to leave open and you'll see why when I attach the collar later. Over here on the serger, I'm going to serge all the like raw edges that will be loose on the inside, basically. 
of both my facing and then my main pieces of this. The underarm seam, the open areas of my sleeve, for example, the side seams of the shirt itself, the seams between the yoke and the main body of the shirt, all that needs to be serged or encased in some way. You can, of course, use French seams, especially on something like this where there's a lot of straight lines. It's a lot easier to do French seams, um, but I just prefer to serge everything because it is fast and easy and the serger is here, so why not? And then it's time to put in all those gathering threads. So I'm over here on the Singer 99K. I have this with just the black Guterman polyester thread that I plan to use for this entire project set to the largest stitch length. And I'm just going to two, do two lines, bleh, do two lines of gathering stitching parallel using my presser foot as a guide so that they're about, I don't know, a fourth of an inch apart within the seam allowance here. And I just have a lot of gathering threads to put on both the front, the back, and both sleeve pieces. So I'm going to do all of that. And then I can sew my collar that we were just working with. So again, I'm starting about a half inch in, well, not about exactly a half inch in, and then I'm going to leave my needle down at the corners up and down the presser foot to move around a corner like so. And again, stop a half inch before the end there. Back over here on the ironing board, I can go ahead and start working on putting my back onto my yoke. So the back yoke, I guess. So I'm going to pin the center first of both pieces so that they're lined up. Then I'll pin like the straight uh, edge and then I'm going to gather this down to fit in the center here along the center back. I mean, it comes out quite a ways from the center back, but we have a lot of gathering in the back of this. It's a billowy, romantic, poetic shirt, you know? If you made this long, by the way, like dress length, and then just wore it with like a wide belt or a corset over it, or a like, um, what is it called when you have like a corset, like a, like a stays inspired top, you know, not like a true fully boned corset, but like a corset inspired style shirt. It would look very cute if you made this like a dress length situation. And often actually men's shirts in the historic past, which this is like vaguely inspired by, would be quite long um, because they would use the shirt itself as an undergarment. So there's also that depending on the era. But I can go ahead and sew this down now that it is pinned in place. So my back yoke to my back shirt, basically. Got all those gathers spaced out and wrangled the way I want them, mostly, for the most part. Once again, this fabric is actually a little bit on the thicker side for something like this. I think this actually, this shirt might behave better in a shantung, which I have never actually worked with the silk shantung, but the polyester shantungs I've worked with do tend to be a little bit thinner uh, or like a lighter weight. So I'll have to try and make one of these in a shantung next because I haven't worked with silk shantung yet and it seems like a area for opportunity. I'm just going to press all my seam allowance up here, remove any errant gathering threads. And then I'm going to do a little bit of top stitching on this just to hold that seam allowance up in place. You could also, I don't know, fold it down if you wanted to, whatever you want to do. I didn't interline this back yoke in any way, but you can, if you would like, you know, this is a very adaptable thing where you can start adding in different facings or interfacing where you want them, depending on what fabric you're using and the finished result you would like. For the front, I do have this space in the center here when I lined up the yoke and the shirt that is uh, blank. And you do want to keep that center blank just for how I'm finishing the front slit and facing for this. Um, but I have, you know, smooth sections on either side and in the middle and then the little puckered gathering bits above the bust, basically, that fit into the yoke just to make this fit down. So I'm going to arrange those gathers and pin them in place. Some men's shirting does have gathering up into the collar, I think. But if you were for example, wanting to make this something a little bit more on the masculine side, um, I would space these gathers out a little bit more instead of keeping them so focused over the bust. If you weren't, for example, dealing with a bust, or even if you are and you just want it to look a little bit more masculine. Really, it's about the kind of swagger you use while wearing the shirt in the end that determines, you know, exactly what gender presentation this is giving off. It's a very, I find piratey, swashbuckly style on both men, women, non-binary folks uh, to be very attractive personally. <laughs> for someone who's ace, if I can say that, at least very aesthetically pleasing, uh, for any gender to be wearing something swashbuckly, I think is a, is a great look, honestly. But that could just be my queer showing, that's right. I'm just going to again press that seam. This time I think I pressed it open because I, for whatever reason, did, decided to not do top stitching on the front even though I had done it on the back. Once again, do I know what I'm up to half the time? Never. You could do either, no top stitching or some. So I pressed down the center of my facing to see where that center line is, because I want to keep that very straight. And what I've done is around that center line, I've come out a quarter of an inch either side and drawn this little slim rectangle down the center. 
I'm going to be careful to pin this so that it lines up with the center of my shirt as well, because I'm pinning these right sides together, you know, um, out on the outside of the shirt. I'm pinning this facing down the center here, and I'm going to sew this rectangle, and then we're going to cut and slip the scissors down this center point here to open up this slit in the neck. And it's going to be a little rectangular slit as opposed to having this come to like a point in the front in any way. It's just going to have this little rectangle open. And I'm actually going to fill this in with a little bit of silk because I decided I wanted more of a placket look as opposed to a slit look. So I'll show you that at the end of this video or near the end of this video. But now that I have that box sewn in over my colored pencil line, I'll remove my pins. We can cut down the center of this shirt. And then at the end, cut a little triangle like so into either corner so that this will lay flat once we press it to the inside. So I'll move my facing to the inside here. Um, it was, again, this fabric is quite crispy, a little bit of body going on here. So I'm going to actually put in some under stitching on either side of this buddy. I can't really maneuver around the bottom, but I can at least go down either side of this with some under stitching to help it stay folded to the inside, this facing. And this blue light on here is making me wish that they had a red fabric with a blue cross weave because it would be very fun. I'm not sure if they have that over at Silk Baron right now. Sometimes they're out of stock of certain colors, you know? They're always coming out new colors over there. It's a very dangerous website. My thread's getting stuck here. But yes, I'm just stitching the seam allowance down to the facing. It's underneath. You can't really see. It's under my right hand here. I'm going down each side of this. Just a little bit of understitching to help keep my facing in place. And I too really like the look of this new filigreed faceplate. I say new, it's probably vintage. So thank you again to the lovely person out there who gifted me this faceplate. But back on the ironing board, I can go ahead and now press this facing to the inside with a little bit more fervor, pressing it into place here, pinning that facing in place of the shoulders as well. It's going to be encased in the shoulder seam here eventually, but I'll just press this smooth, hopefully not getting too many puckers down at my corners. I will perhaps tack this down here so that my facing doesn't move around. Um, you could do like top stitching or any embroidery on top of this as well to help keep this facing in place and also add a decorative finish. But I will now sew my shoulder seams. So I'm pinning this right sides together, the back onto the front here, like so. Pin both my shoulder seams for those yokes and then sew and then sew that over here on the machine. Again, half inch seam allowance as usual over here on the 99K. And again, I am still dealing with my lingering cough and, you know, goopy bits in my respiratory system. So apologies again for my voice sounding like goop this month, but perhaps it's a little bit ghastly, a little bit ghoulish here for the spookiest of months. But now that those shoulder seams are so and I can press them open like this. I have my area here where my collar will go. We're starting to get some sort of a tunicky garment going on. Now on my sleeves, I'm gonna again measure out six inches from either side of the center, put my gathering threads in, and then I will lay my shirt out flat like this. So I have my front yoke on the left-hand side, the back yoke, the back here is on the right-hand side. I'll pin the center of my sleeve to that shoulder seam. Then I'm gonna mark on my garment 10 inches down, like I had on my pattern as well with a pin and start pinning the smooth part of the sleeve all the way up to where the gathering begins. And then I'll do the other side the same way. And then I will just gather all the middle bit of this sleeve down so that it fits in along the shoulder seam. This is a completely straight or flat arm side. So I'm setting my sleeves in flat like this with everything open before I sew the side seams. I will sew the side seams and the underarm seam of the sleeve at the same time. So I'll show you that. <clears throat> But for now, I just need to space out my gathers and sort of arrange them so that they're evenly spaced across this area here in the center shoulder area of my sleeve. It's possible that talking this much when my voice and lungs and everything are not very happy probably isn't the best idea, honestly. But, you know, work needs to be done. Whether or not my little flesh prison is up for the idea or not. So, here we are. You can't, you can't bring me down during spooky season. I have things to do. But once that is sewn on, I'm going to press all that seam allowance into the sleeve. 
just with the hopes that it will hold out my puff of my sleeve just a little bit more even, you know, works uh, pretty well there. And then I will go ahead and do the same thing on the other side, again, measuring 10 inches down from my shoulder seam, where my sleeve needs to go, pinning everything into place, moving my gathers so they're evenly spaced, all that jazz. I actually was looking at, because this Dupioni is uh, basically reversible, either side technically the same, but sometimes one side has looser slubs than the other, so I was making sure that the side of the Dupioni that was going to face outwards was going to be nice, because the inside and the outside of this fabric is, you know, you determine that less so than the fabric itself. But now that my sleeves are sewn onto the main body, I can go ahead and again sew that side seam slash underarm seam all in one. I'm just going to pivot at the underarm. And I'm not even going to clip that underarm just because it's already like lowered and in like a baggy space. So I don't need to clip it uh, because <clears throat> normally I would clip a corner so that it would lay flat on the other side, but I don't really need this to lay flat on the other side. So I'm just going to keep the structural integrity of having this corner here unclipped between the body and the sleeve. And I love this blue and red reflecting off of that faceplate. You see what I mean? Oh, it's just so cute. The stripes were fine, but the swirly swirls, even better. I'm just gonna stick my little pressing arm in here so I can press open that up to that corner, basically. And the same with the sleeve here, but I'm just not gonna even worry about that underarm corner. It's not even gonna be bulky because this underarm is like dropped a little bit. I won't even, I'll never feel it, you know? So it's fine. And I did actually, I forgot to mention, leave the last uh, three inches of my sleeve seam open down where the cuff will be, because instead of doing a cuff opening or placket like you saw me do on my other silk shirt, again, see the link in the card to see that, I'm just going to have a little bit of this underarm seam open here. It puts it in like not exactly the right spot for there to be an opening in the underside of my sleeve, but it's also a lot easier and quicker, so it'll be fine. But I will put two lines of gathering stitching at the end of each of my sleeves so I can fit these into my cuffs. You can see I already pre-ironed my cuffs uh, with half inch on all sides but the last. Um, so this will be easier to fold into place afterwards. But I put my two lines of gathering stitching all along the end of my sleeve here. And now I have to wrangle all of this fabric into this small cuff and distribute my gathers as best I can. Um, you could also pleat this if you wanted to. Or like even like randomly pleat it, you know, it's fine. Or very nicely measured pleats this. Or cartridge pleat it would be nice. Definitely would be pretty uh, historic looking if you did it that way. Or you could do it shearing or any different like kind of pleat patterns would be fun. You can also experiment with the length and width of your cuff. Um, here I'm just doing one inch cuffs because of the way I want to finish them later on uh, as a drawstring kind of cuff finish. You'll see. But if you wanted to have a wider cuff and do again a placket and some buttons or frog closures or clasps or anything like that. It would be quite fun. This is really a, quite a versatile sort of style. You can really add your own flair onto it and make your own decisions with these basic rectangles. But once I have that all stitched on, I'm gonna try and maneuver all the gathering into my cuff basically and fold those already pre-ironed sides of my cuff in and down to the inside. I'm going to leave the ends of this open because I'm going to use this again as a drawstring. You'll see in a sort of way. It's a little bit, it's like a half inch big enough from around my wrist or like bigger than my wrist measurement is. But I will fell down it to the uh, inside except for the ends. So basically I'm closing that up, sewing that all down, um, but not the ends. And I'm going to make this like ribbon. I, I use those strips, those straight uh, edged strips of fabric I showed you at the very end that I mentioned, just two inch strips that I sewed into the little tubes and you can see I'm wrestling with turning those inside and outside out. Um, so I have these are about, I don't know, 11 inches long <laughs> and I'm going to take about three or four inches of elastic here. I'm going to attach that to the middle of this. So instead of just putting the ribbon in and having to tie my sleeves each time, I'm going to tie my sleeves shut with the hidden elastic on the inside of my cuff. So you saw me do this for my peasant shirt as well. I'm just going to use a big safety pin to feed that through. So it's a, it's secretly elastic cuff. You know, the elastic will be inside of the drawstring at all times, so it'll look like a drawstring cuff, but secretly it's an elastic situation. Again, not very historically accurate, but a lot easier to not have to tie the bows on your cuffs all the dang time. You can make your bows as short or as long as you would like, um, but you could even just have this like uh, close, like you could sew these ribbons shut where the cuff ends, but that secret elastic in there would mean that this can go over your hand. Hopefully you know what I mean. See also the peasant blouse video for probably a more coherent explanation of my 
way of doing cuffs like this. But I'm just going to tie these into nice, floopy, romantic bows here at my cuffs. Um, this also means it's really easy to like scrunch your sleeves up your arm, by the way. You'll see that later when I'm modeling this. That's right, it doesn't go wrong at this point. <laughs> but I'm going to clip my curves and corners of my collar because the only thing left to do on this shirt is to hem the bottom of it and attach my collar at the top of the neckline. So I'm going to go ahead and press this buddy into submission, like so. Again, you can do under stitching or edge stitching on your collar as well if you'd like. Top stitching, embroidery, whatever you would like to do. I'm just going to find the center of my collar with a pin here and do the same for my back neckline because of course I don't have it marked. I could have marked it earlier with some colored pencil while I was arranging my pattern pieces, but that would have been foresight, you know, not necessarily my strong suit. Fold my collar down a little bit out of the way. That's why I left that half inch open here at the center front. And I can go ahead and pin this onto my neckline. Again, the collar or like the neckline of the shirt is going to be curvier than the collar is. That's what makes the collar stand up compared to laying down against the shirt. Um, so you are sewing something that is a bit curvier to something that is a bit straighter, kind of annoying. Do I, I use kind of like a lot of pins and just try to be careful to not get puckers in this seam as I'm stitching it. Honestly, this is probably the most difficult seam of this shirt, I would say, because there are a lot of straight lines in this one. So if you haven't sewn many garments before, this is not a terrible place to start. And again, these shirts look so nice, just like on their own, tucked into a skirt or trousers, um, especially high-waisted things, of course, I prefer. And then uh, you can wear these with a waistcoat or a vest over them, or like a corset top over them, a belt. And of course, I started stitching this and my thread got all tangled and had a problem, mostly because this was the end of the spool of thread, as you can see. And I had some like weak, bad thread on the end of this. No shade to Guterman or anything, but this was kind of like a bad spool near the end here. And I should have just switched it out. And I think I eventually, you know, threw it across the room in frustration and did so. But now that my collar is attached, I'm going to basically just kind of uh, double check this and check for puckers basically to make sure everything's looking okay before I go ahead and clip the curve of that seam like so. And then I will press my collar under like the other side of this collar under a half inch and line it up. And then I can go ahead and slip stitch this by hand to finish it off. But I just have to press all that seam allowance up into the collar itself. This is why I say if you make the collar quite thin, you're not gonna have a lot of room. You'll have to trim your seam allowance and it's gonna be kind of annoying. It, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's gonna be kind of annoying. So press all that seam allowance up in there, clipping curves where needed, pin that into place so that it's a nice clean finish on the inside, especially if you wanna wear your collar like turned back, which you definitely can. Use this as kind of a convertible collar if you wanted to. And you'll see I wear it kind of open in the end. So you'll see what I mean, but just pinning this cleanly onto the inside and then I will hand stitch this into place. You have to let me know in the end if you think this Dupioni is too poofy for this. If I should try a Shantung next, do you want to see that even? The same shirt in a different fabric, a slightly different fabric? Or should I stick with this billowy Dupioni and make another of these in another, in another color? Because they are quite fun. So I wouldn't be opposed to making more in the future. Now I'm going to take another one of those random strips of fabric. Uh, this is just along the straight grain. And I'm going to sew it with only a quarter inch and then I'm going to trim the seam allowance down to about an eighth of an inch, a little bit over because this fabric, uh, being that the, it's like an un, uneven, almost raw silk kind of weave to peony. So, uh, it's not the like strongest on the cross here. So when I tried to turn this tiny noodle right side out, it was quite annoying and, uh, not all of this like length of this worked, but I was trying to make a thin cord of silk basically to use as a tie uh, along my front neckline and placket that you'll see in a minute. So as you can see, it's like fraying apart in my hands as I try and do this. This is probably not the best way of doing this. I should have just like folded it and had stitching visible, like visible stitching on the outside and created a cord in a different way or like used a matching ribbon or something because this was probably not the best idea. But here is my thin-ish cord of this. I'm trying to find bits of it that were the strongest after that. Um, just turning it the other side out really this fabric wasn't exactly strong enough for that but i also have made this little finished one inch wide maybe one and a half inch wide rectangle here to fill in my neckline so my neckline here the slit is about a half inch wide so i'm just going to fill that in with this piece pin it in place and then i'm going to pin my ties about halfway up like so 
on either side, and then I'm just gonna hand stitch this all in place. Is it the absolute prettiest on the inside? No. Is it gonna work? That's right, it is. So maybe I'll do this a little bit differently next time uh, if I make another one of these with the same kind of idea. But I didn't think of filling in the neckline until halfway through making this shirt. So once again, we have the, you know, creative process uh, mixed with tutorial here. I know what I'm doing most of the time, and then sometimes I have an idea halfway through and things change. So here we go. But I'm uh, slip stitching this on the outside of, to the plackety little bit that I put in here just for a nice clean finish. And on the inside, I actually just felled it down to the facing. So you'll see that. And I was attaching those ties at the same time while I was over here. But I will flip to the inside eventually here and show you what the inside of that looks like. So this is just fell down along the facing on the inside. Still looks rather nice, I think, especially if you make nice even stitches, which is not something, again, I'm necessarily known for uh, because I'm not. I'm a perfectionist in some things and not in others, you know? I'm gonna tie off my thread here and then on the outside, I will notice that when I was felling that, I caught the outside a little bit. Ugh. So I'm gonna pull out these stitches on the center of this and re-fell that down because I didn't want my threads to show on the outside if they didn't have to. Probably you wouldn't notice in this slubbed fabric, but there you go. There's my perfectionism coming out. It's weird when it shows up, but occasionally it does. But then the last thing to do to finish off this shirt blouse situation was to hem the main body of it. So I had already surged it just so it would not fray while I was working with the rest of it. I'm just gonna turn that up a quarter of an inch twice and I will just machine stitch this hem. You could hand stitch it if it was going to show, but because I will be wearing the shirt tucked in 90% of the time, I did not bother, I just went ahead and ran that through the machine to finish this shirt. And here is my finished decadent red silk billowy blouse. Honestly, it might be a little too billowy because this dupioni has quite a lot of body to it, so my sleeves are quite epic in this. But, you know, whoever complained about an epic sleeve, I guess, you know, we're just, when, when we talk about adding muchness, this is the muchiest. And I did actually make a wearable mock up while designing this pattern. So here is that shirt here. It is a black and green sort of slubbed shirting from fabric.com. I'm not sure if they still have this fabric available. If they do, I will link it below. This is a much, like it's a cotton fabric, but has a much more of a linen or natural texture and it's a little bit more drapey and I think is actually better for this style of shirt. Sadly, this fabric did come in red, but it is out of stock now. So I could have had a red one of these as well, but you know, we'll have to go with silk, bummer. I can't tell you how much I wish I had a rapier or some sort of a sword in my collection in my prop closet to be able to pair with this shirt just because it feels like, you know, a very good opportunity for a ladies with a sword moment. But sadly, I do not own one. So future investment, I need to make a really nice sort of three musketeers sort of rapier with a big, you know, cage handle. I'm going to need one of those to hang on the wall. Uh, so something to think about when I move into my next place. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this design came together today. And thank you as always for watching. I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.